So far, we've seen positive evidence for theism, but what should we do with the counter evidence, like divine hiddenness and the problem of evil? These are closely related arguments, and they go something like this. If God existed, then he would make his existence obvious to everyone, but he hasn't made his existence obvious to everyone. Thus, God does not exist, and if God existed, then there wouldn't be a vast amount of suffering in the world. But there is a vast amount of suffering in the world, so God does not exist. In this video, I'm going to summarize a few responses that Michael Rhoda lays out in his book, Taking Pascal's Wager. Let's begin with the hiddenness argument. Rhoda answers with a parable taken from the work of Soren Kierkegaard. The parable goes like this. A youthful king was on some royal business one day in a nearby village. While there, he saw a beautiful maiden from afar. He inquired about her and discovered that she was very poor, but incredibly kind and generous. The more he learned about her, the more he found himself falling in love. But there was a problem. He realized that if he approached her as royalty, it would be difficult for her to freely choose him for the right reasons. Would it be for love or wealth? He loved her so much, he took a risk. He temporarily set aside his royalty, disguised himself as a traveling laborer, and moved to the village to pursue a relationship with her in an ordinary way. The parable is intended to show why God doesn't make his existence more obvious. It gives us reason to doubt that first premise. God doesn't merely want our belief or obedience. He wants our freely given love. For an extended response to the problem of divine hiddenness, check out a couple of interviews I've done by clicking links 1 and 2 in the description below. Now let's turn to the problem of evil. Rhoda outlines what he considers to be the best responses to this argument. One comes from Peter Van Inwagen, and the other from Eleanor Stump. Both build upon a basic free will defense. By that, I mean that God created human beings with a significant degree of freedom because there's great value in letting his creatures have a real say in how they will live their lives, in who they will become, and in what or whom they will love. But that freedom comes with a risk. It can be misused, introducing evil and suffering into the world. This is a great start, but there are at least two problems facing the basic free will defense. First, it can explain why God would allow some suffering, but not this much. For example, God could easily have stopped the Nazi rise to power in its early stages without completely taking away anyone's free will. Second, it can't explain natural evil very well, things like earthquakes and cancer. So Peter Van Inwagen and Eleanor Stump have expanded the basic free will defense to address these problems. Let's start with Peter Van Inwagen. There are two important elements of Van Inwagen's expanded free will defense. First is his story of why God might allow vast amounts of suffering. And second is the role of vagueness. His story goes like this. God created very clever primates through the evolutionary process, chose a small group of them, miraculously gave them rationality and free will, and placed them in a paradise where they would be free from age and death so long as they remained in union with him. But somehow they freely chose to separate themselves from God making them vulnerable to disease and death. Even worse, once separated from God, their selfish nature genetically wired into them from millions of years of evolution, joined with their new rationality, produced an inborn tendency to do evil. But out of love, God formed a rescue plan, his goal being to reunite humans with himself. In order to respect their free will though, this plan would require cooperation. They would first have to realize that they needed to be rescued. And for them to realize that, God needs to allow suffering. If he endlessly performed miracles to stop their suffering, they'd be content and see no need to cooperate with him. So, why would God allow vast amounts of suffering, including natural evils? Based on this story, the answer is to prevent something even worse. Too many humans content to do evil, failing to realize their need to be rescued by God. Now, Peter Van Inwagen admits he has no proof that this story is true, but so long as it is even possibly true, 
God might allow a vast amount of suffering in the world. So the first premise in the argument from evil can be rejected. Now, what is vagueness? A concept is vague in the philosophical sense. If there is no clear dividing line between situations where the concept applies and situations where it doesn't. The concept bald is like this. If you have a head full of hair, you're not bald. If you have no hair, you are bald. But if you start out with a head full of hair and we pluck them one by one, it's not clear that we'll reach a last single hair that, once removed, transforms you from not being bald to being bald. Peter Van Inwagen takes this concept of vagueness and applies it to God's providence. Say God wanted a farm in Ohio to produce an exceptionally great harvest in the year 1952. So he sends a good amount of rain that year. But how much exactly? How many drops? Whatever number he picks, it will still be true that he could have allowed one less drop to fall without jeopardizing the overall fertility of the farm. So he has to draw the line somewhere. Similarly, God has to decide how much suffering he will prevent and how much he will allow wherever he draws the line. It will be true that he could have prevented one more instance of suffering without making a difference to his overall goal, helping us realize that we need to be rescued. And that's why there may not be a particular reason for every particular case of suffering. Now let's look at Eleanor Stump's answer to the problem of evil. Then we'll compare the two. Stump draws heavily on the views of Thomas Aquinas. So let me briefly describe those views, and we'll see how Stump applies them in her response. Aquinas thought that every human being will eventually either be in heaven or hell. Those in hell have, through their own choices, become permanently alienated from themselves and others, including God. For those in heaven, union with God can come in degrees meaning it's possible to be closer or less close to God, even though everyone will have as much union with God as they desire. Second, change in one's openness to God's love is no longer possible after death. Third, every human being has a sort of cancer of the will that inclines them to prefer their own short-term pleasure over greater goods, like union with God. And sooner or later, this proneness to evil blows up into a moral monstrosity. Fourth, God allows suffering as a sort of medicine that provides healing of this moral and spiritual cancer within us all. So Stump thinks that God permits suffering in order to provide the adult sufferer with an opportunity to let go of lesser goods he or she clings to in place of moral goodness and God. In other words, the goal of allowing suffering is to ward off the worst thing for that sufferer, the unending loneliness that will result if he or she remains closed to God. And in cases where the person is already open to God, suffering provides an opportunity for the sufferer to grow morally and spiritually in ways that allow them to enjoy greater closeness to God and others in the next life. Though we aren't aware how a particular suffering is intended by God to benefit the sufferer, the connection to a benefit for the sufferer is always there. Now we can see some of the similarities and differences in these two views. Both suggest that God may use vast amounts of suffering to reveal our need to be rescued and give us an opportunity to grow morally and spiritually so we have closer union with God. However, they differ at the level of particular cases of suffering. Peter Van Inwagen thinks that God may not have a particular reason to allow every particular case of suffering. Eleanor Stump thinks that God does have a particular reason for every particular case of suffering. I'm more inclined towards Stump's view, but both accounts are real possibilities. And this is all that's required to show that we should be skeptical of that first premise in the argument from evil. For an extended response to the problem of evil, check out a couple of interviews I've done by clicking links number three and four in the description of this video. So now we've seen evidence for a necessarily existing, intelligent creator of the universe. And the counter evidence from hiddenness and evil isn't compelling. We've also seen that Christian doctrine resonates with our human experience. So now we ask, is there solid historical evidence for the truth of Christianity? Yes, and that is what I will discuss in my next video. Please, if you enjoyed this video, give me a like. Check out the rest of my channel. 
If you enjoy the content, subscribe and turn on the little bell for notifications. Thanks for your support. See you soon.